Well, on behalf of the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, we welcome you to the Harold B. Lee Library for our fall semester book of the semester lecture. It's our great pleasure to welcome to campus Professor Eric Klein, of George Washington University. His book, 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed, is our selection as the fall book of the semester. We hope if you haven't picked up a copy that you will do so. Uh, I understand it's available for 20% off at the BYU store. Uh, and again, uh, we welcome you to the library for today's lecture. Uh, we won't, we'll forego other announcements in the interest of time, but just uh, for those of you that are coming in, there's still our seats here in the front and uh, a few as we scatter through. Uh, when we wrote, move to the library, it's not too far, but sometimes it throws us off a little bit. Uh, we will be recording today's lecture, so it will be available on our website at kennedy.byu.edu and available on our podcast through iTunes. And for those of you who are Twitter inclined, we'll be live tweeting with the hashtag Kennedy Live. Uh, we'd like to begin with an opening prayer, as is our custom, and we've invited Monica Prevet, a humanities major from Fayetteville, Georgia, to offer that prayer. Monica? Our dear Father in heaven, we are so glad to be here today and that we have this opportunity to listen to this lecture. We are so glad to have this university and that we can serve thee and learn more about the world and all that thou hast given us. And we pray this name, Jesus Christ, amen. Dr. Eric Klein is a classical and biblical archaeologist and ancient historian whose primary fields of study are biblical archaeology, the military history of the Mediterranean world from antiquity to present, the Bronze Age Aegean, and the international connections between Greece, Egypt, and the Near East during the late Bronze Age. He's published several books and articles in his area of expertise. His book from 2014, 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed, our Kennedy Center fall semester book of the semester selection has been described by one as a detailed but uh, accessible synthesis of the findings and hypotheses of researchers concerned with the societies that developed around the Mediterranean throughout the second millennium BC with a special focus on the late Bronze Age. Professor Klein is professor of classics anthropology and history at George Washington University in Washington DC. He is also the director of the GW uh, Capital Archaeological Institute a National Geographic Explorer, a Fulbright Scholar, an NEH Public Scholar, and an award-winning teacher and author. He received his PhD in Ancient History from the University of Pennsylvania, an MA in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from Yale University, and an AB in Classical Archaeology from Dartmouth College. In May 2015, he was awarded an honorary doctoral degree from Muhlenberg College. Professor Klein is married and has several children, uh, and thanks to the internet, two cats and a number of fish. I don't know if that's true. He has, his wife is associate professor in the history department at George Washington University. Uh, writing in the New Yorker, Adam Gopnik described the book saying, the memorable thing about Klein's book is the strangely recognizable picture he paints of this very far away time. The silent conspiracy of stones, the obvious fact that architecture survives best and longest, showing us the vast, the cyclopean, the cool, the pyramidical, makes the Bronze Age look strangely monolithic and remote. All those burned out palaces, all that broken pottery, all those Egyptians in profile procession. In truth, as Klein explains, it was as globalized and cosmopolitan a time as on, as on any on record, albeit with a much smaller cosmos. It's our great pleasure to welcome to Brigham Young University, Professor Eric Klein, Book of the Semester, Fall 2016. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me in the back? All right, it is a pleasure to be here and an honor to be the book of the semester. Thank you very much for that. It's my first time here, absolutely gorgeous campus, gorgeous location, so it's uh, really nice to be here. And yes, I do have fish. Uh, they change every semester and I name them according to what I'm teaching. So if it's Greek history, they've got Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. If it's, you know, Near Eastern history, Shupiluliuma, Tushrata, Akhenaten. It just depends on the semester. But anyway, um, this book, uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, came out a couple of years ago. I've been waiting for about 20 years to publish this because uh, the late Bronze Age, 
1700 to 1200 BC, is near and dear to my heart. So when Rob Tempio of Princeton University Press said to me, will you write a book on the collapse? What happened at the end of the Late Bronze Age? I said, sure, I'll, I'll do that. But I also want to write about what collapsed, because I don't think nearly enough people know what happened during the Late Bronze Age. And so I said, look, I'll start the book off and I'll end the book with the collapse, but the middle part will be about the civilizations that were there, what they did, and, and what we lost. So uh, he said, sure, that'd be fine, that's a deal, but in return I want one thing. He said, when you're done with it, can we make a, a book trailer? And I said, a, a book trailer, what's that? And he says, well, it's like a movie trailer, a coming attraction, but for a book. And I said, I, I've never heard of that. Uh, he says, oh, it's all the rage. I said, really? I've never heard of that. And so he sent me a link, and he says, here, watch. And I opened it up, and some poor guy has his book, and he says, I've just published a book. Please buy it. Uh, <laughs> I said, Rob, even I have my limits. I will not do that. And he says, no, no, no. I want something way over the top, and, and you know, would you be willing? And I said, well, maybe, reluctantly. Um, and in fact, I had an ex-student of mine who runs a film company, and I said, Jesse, you want to make an over-the-top book trailer? He says, yeah, 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 sure. So we did it, and we put it out, and I don't know if it contributed to the sales or not, but it was, it was kind of fun, and it went over well enough that Rob then calls me up. He says, I'm about to sign another author to a book deal, and he says, as part of the contract, he wants a book trailer. I'm like, okay. So anyway, if you want, I've got it with me. You want to see it? All right, it's only like 53 seconds long and hopefully the sound will work and, and we'll go from there. So let me see if I can get it working here. Let's see. So I, I will tell Jesse you clapped, he'll be happy. So, as I say, I have no idea if that impacted it or not, but it was, it was fun to make and totally over the top. Now, I fully realize that I'm not the first person to be talking about collapse of ancient societies. In fact, I think Edward Gibbon probably had the, the first one that came out with the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And then Joseph Tainter, Collapse of Complex uh, Societies, and I understand he's lectured here. Uh, and then Jared Diamond's Collapse, of course. The difference between what they did and what I was doing in my book is that they all were looking at the collapse of individual civilizations, Roman, Maya, Mongols, Indus Valley, and in fact, Jared Diamond, even the different chapters are just with different civilizations. What we've got here, late Bronze Age, what I'm talking about is the collapse of basically a globalized world system in which multiple civilizations are all interacting and they're at least partially dependent upon one another. Now, I do use the word globalized with caution. They were not globalized like we are today. But if you look at, say, from Italy on the east until Iran and Iraq on the west, and from Turkey up in the north down to Egypt in the south, they were all interacting, they were internationalized, and they were, to a certain extent, globalized for their time period. So my wife, Diane Klein, who does social network analysis, put these together to show you that what we're talking about, even though it's 3,200 years ago, is what we would call a small world. And that is everybody's either in direct contact or no more than one, two, or three steps away. So if you don't know somebody personally, you know somebody who knows them, right? You know the, who is it? It's Kevin Bacon with the movie game, right? Who's in it? Same type of thing for back here. So when the late Bronze Age collapsed, the whole globalized system went down. And for me, this was of great interest uh, in part because 
our world now and their world back then are two of the only instances when there were such interconnected societies that if one went down, it impacted all of the others. So we're talking here, late Bronze Age, 1700 to 1200 BC. This is a map of the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the area that we'll be talking about for a brief time today. And you can see highlighted in some of the colors some of the different civilizations. They are what I call the G8 of the ancient world, though I'm kind of fudging a little bit because in order to get eight, uh, I had to include Mycenaeans and Minoans as Aegean, so in Greece. But you can see the Egyptians on here, Cypriots, Hittites are up in Turkey, Mitanni are over in Syria and Iraq, Assyrians and Babylonians. Now, some of these or many of these may be foreign names to you, quite literally. So actually at the back of the book, I've got a glossary of names with a little identification of who they are. But I, I, would, I would guess that you know more about it than you actually think you do, especially if you've had some of the ancient Near Eastern courses here. But how many have heard of Hatshepsut, the famous female pharaoh? Okay, she's in this time period. Tutmosis III, stepson and nephew. Amenhotep III, he's my boy. I wrote my master's thesis on him. How about, how about Akhenaten, heretic pharaoh? Right, okay. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that maybe some of you have heard of King Tut. I'd be correct? Right, okay. And Ramses II, pharaoh of the Exodus, possibly. Ramses III, he's actually going to be kind of the star of our show today. So you see, if you've heard of even one or more of those, you already know about this period. But this is also when the Battle of Kadesh took place, for example, between the Egyptians and the Hittites. A little thing called the Trojan War took place. How many of you saw the movie starring Brad Pitt? How many of you wish you hadn't seen the movie starring Brad Pitt? Right, all right. And the Exodus, if it takes place, is gonna take place in this time period as well. Now, we're in the Bronze Age. This is tin and copper. If you wanna try making it at home, 90% copper, 10% tin. If you don't have tin, you can use arsenic. I don't recommend that. You won't live long, but you can make arsenical bronze. Now, the copper is no problem. It comes from Cyprus, which I've got uh, circled on this map. In fact, the name Kypros means copper. The tin is a bit more problematic. You could go all the way up to Cornwall, perhaps. Uh, there's also a couple of mines in southeastern Turkey. But the main source of tin in the Bronze Age is Afghanistan, particularly the Badakhshan region. Now, anybody here have any lapis lazuli jewelry or know anybody that does? All right, that comes from the same region, tin and lapis, both from the Badakhshan region of Afghanistan. So that is going to create quite an effort to get it, let's say, a couple of hundred miles, if not a couple of thousand miles. So we know, for example, at Mari, there is an ancient text from about 1800 BC, so you know, almost 4,000 years ago. And in one of the letters, it's talking about tin coming all the way from Afghanistan. It's making its way to Mari, then to the site of Ugarit on the north coast of uh, Syria, and from there to Crete. And it talks about the Kaftorians, which is their name for the Minoans of Crete. So giving tin to them, and there's even an interpreter. So we know that there is basically long distance trade and international connections. Um, if the trade routes were cut at any point, of course, that's going to create a problem because if you don't get, if you don't have tin, you can't make bronze and then you're in trouble. And I think that's one of the things that contributes to the collapse just after 1200 BC. A colleague of mine, Carol Bell in England, likened the necessity for having tin back then to our necessity for oil today. And so she said, trying to get tin for the pharaohs of Egypt and the kings of the Hittites is like trying to get oil for the US president today. And I think that's a very good analogy. Now, the Mari letters that I just mentioned, the one that has the tin being delivered, they also talk about some of the other trade that's going on at this time. And for instance, one of them mentions a Kaftorian weapon, that would be a Minoan weapon from Crete, which makes its way all the way over 
to the Tigris and Euphrates, to Mari, and it says the top and the base are covered with gold, its top is encrusted with lapis lazuli. Now, this is actually a dagger from the death pits at war, but it must have looked something similar to that. So definitely fit for a king. But they're also sending other things, which kind of tickled my fancy, because it, it means that nothing has really changed. So here's a pair of leather shoes, which I presume are either sandals or boots. They're in the Kaftorian style. So if you've been to Crete, you know they're still making leather sandals and leather boots today. Which to the palace of Hammurabi, king of Babylon, and yes, that is the Hammurabi, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, and all that, Bakhdi Lehman official carried, but which were returned. Now, I've never known why he returned the sandals. Um, were they too small? Were they so last millennium? <laughs> I don't know. I had my students read the Code of Hammurabi, and they looked through all 272 or 282 laws, and I said, find me the penalty for returning shoes. And they came back after a couple of days and said, there's nothing in the Code of Hammurabi. I said, exactly. He got away scot-free. So in addition to the raw materials and all that, they're also exchanging finished goods, and sometimes they didn't always like them. So in terms of the international trade and the globalization and the interconnections uh, that were in, in practice, let me just show you a couple of examples before I then go on to completely obliterate all of them. So first of all, Hatshepsut, the female pharaoh, she says on her mortuary temple, that she sent an embassy or an expedition down to Punt. And you can see the boats that she said she sent down there. And in fact, she shows us pictures of the people in Punt and the goods that they brought back. Uh, and indeed, the lowermost picture has an inscription, and it tells us that this is the Queen of Punt, and we know her name is Eti. So we know what they look like, we know their goods. Uh, and the one thing, though, that we didn't know was where Punt was. People were thinking maybe Eritrea, maybe Yemen, and the debate went on for decades until finally, they just recently, in the last couple of years, analyzed some baboon mummies in the British Museum, and the DNA fits with modern day baboons in Eritrea and Ethiopia. So if that fits, we now know where Punt is, and it's basically Ethiopia, Eritrea, which is kind of neat to finally figure that out after all this time. Now, Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III, her successor, are also trading with all kinds of people. Uh, and we have here a tomb painting from uh, the tomb of Rekmere, who was the vizier of Egypt, the right-hand man. And in here, we see people pictured from the Aegean. They're bringing things from Crete and mainland Greece. There's a little bit of a debate about this particular painting. One of the kilts of one of these guys is painted over, and people have said, oh, it was originally Minoans, and then it shows that they were taken over by Mycenaeans, and that's why they repainted the kilt. I'm like, well, maybe, but he could also have just made a mistake and wanted to repaint it. I don't, you know, you can read as much or as little into these as you want. But another tomb from the same time period, and we're talking here 15th century BC. Uh, this guy, the one on the far right, is got a bull's head on a platter, and that's definitely from Canossa. So that's definitely a Minoan. Uh, and we know this also because the inscription tells us this. So lots of connections between Egypt and Crete at that time. Uh, and it continues on. Amenhotep III, my favorite guy. Uh, these are the two <clears throat> colossi at the entrance to his palace. Anybody actually been there and seen them? They're, they're very large, right? 60 feet tall and all that. Uh, misidentified, Memnon's actually an Ethiopian prince who fought in the Trojan War. And the later Greeks and Romans who came as tourists to these and actually inscribed graffiti on the statue bases, they identified it as Memnon. It's actually Amenhotep III. These stood at the entrance to his mortuary temple. You notice that temple? is not there. It was used as a quarry by later kings who said, why should I go create new blocks? Let me just reuse these. But even so, there are still things in there. This has been excavated since the 1960s. And they found statue bases for smaller statues, like only about 10 feet tall. And each of these have lists of places known to the Egyptians. Now, 
Amenhotep III is ruling in the 14th century, 1391 to 1353. Don't let the dates throw you, but we're right in the middle of my favorite period. And in fact, this guy, this is the guy I want to meet, right? Anybody ever said, if you could go back in history, who would you meet? I would want to meet Amenhotep III and live in his world for a while. I doubt I'd be alive for more than about 48 hours, but it would be a wonderful 48 hours. And I would ask him all about what he was doing and this and that. Well, on one of his statue base lists are names that have really never been seen in Egypt before this time and won't be seen again. Uh, the two on the right, though, we know. The two on the right, Keftiu and Tanaya. The Keftiu is the Egyptian name for Crete, just like Kaftor uh, is up in Mesopotamia. And Tanaya is the name for mainland Greece, as far as we can tell. So Mycenaeans and Minoans on the right-hand side, never mind that they're kind of handcuffed uh, with their hands behind their back. That's just the way that the Egyptians did um, the iconographical convention for foreigners. They didn't actually rule over them, but it was implied. Now, the names on the other side of the list and going around uh, the other side, 14 other names, and these have never been seen in Egypt before. Amnisos, Festos, Kaidonia, Mycenae, Dicte, Mathana, Naphtheon, Kithra, uh, Ilios, probably not Troy, probably a site on Crete, Knossos, and then Amnisos again. Now, I think this is an area not just you know, known to them, but since we've got objects at those sites with Amenhotep's name on them, or the name of his wife, Queen T, these are faience plaque fragments at Mycenae. There's also a scarab here, that's the one on the right. The one on the left is the impression it makes. I actually think that this statue base is recording the itinerary of a voyage or voyages that were sent to Greece from Egypt back somewhere around, you know, 1380, 1375 BC. And I think that's why Amnisos is on there twice. You come from Egypt, you get to Crete, and it's been a long voyage. You're like, all right, everybody off, use the bathroom, get a drink of water, and then we keep going. And they go around Crete when they know the Minoans for quite a while by this point. Then they go up to the mainland Greece and the Mycenaeans who are just emerging on the scene at this time. And they're like, oh, let's go visit Mycenae and the new king up there. And then they come back and the last stop again is Amnisos. And they're like, all right, get ready for the voyage back to Egypt. Everybody get their water, use the bathroom, and then we get on board. All right, so I think this is why Amnisos is on there twice. I don't think Amenhotep III went himself. I think this is a voyage, but it was, you know, I think fairly frequent. And one of the reasons why I say this is that we've got at least one shipwreck, actually two shipwrecks from this time period, Ulebrun and Cape Galadonia, about a century apart. Ulebrun went down at 1300 BC. This is a National Geographic rendition of it. This one ship, which went down off the coast of Turkey, has the bits and pieces, goods, raw materials, finished goods from seven different civilizations on board. Egyptian, Hittite, Canaanite, Cypriot, Mycenaean, Minoan, uh, you name it, it is on board. This ship for me is a microcosm of the globalization at that time. So here we've got the wreck, uh, Ulebrun, 140 feet down, and you can see on the left of the picture, its cargo was mostly pure copper ingots, more than 300 of them. The stones in the middle with the, the holes in them, those are stone anchors. They would have used them one at a time as they needed them. But there was 10 tons of raw copper on board, 300 or more ingots. And if you mix it with enough tin, this is enough to outfit an army of 300 soldiers with swords and shields and helmets and everything you need. So I hope this ship was insured when it went down. Somebody lost a fortune. And I'm not really joking about that. They did have insurance back then. We have Near Eastern records showing they did insure the, uh, the ships. But if you've got the copper, you need tin. And yes, upper left-hand corner, tin. There's actually a ton of tin on board. So you could make all that bronze. There's also going down uh, terebinth resin from the pistachio tree. There are um, pieces of ivory from both elephant and hippo. Uh, brand new unused Cypriot and Canaanite pottery on the far lower right. And then up top, perhaps my favorite objects, those are ingots of raw glass 
colored with cobalt, so they're blue. And in fact, when they analyzed these at the Corning Museum of Glass, they also analyzed Mycenaean glass and Egyptian glass, and it was identical. They were getting their glass all from the same source, probably from somewhere in North Syria at that time. So the ship may have been going around and around and around like the blue lines on this Nat Geo map, or it could have been from one king to another. I do not rule out the fact that it might have been a royal gift. And uh, it could also have been a private merchant. And I say this because from about 40 years later, dating to about 1260 BC, we've got what's called the Seneranu text, which is from Ugarit, that city on the north coast of Syria. And it says, from the present day, and um, you can read it as easily as I can, but let me translate it if you're in the back and you can't see it. Uh, from the present day, Amostamru, son of Nikmepa, king of Ugarit, exempts Sinaranu, son of Siginu. Um, and by the way, yes, I do name my fish these upon occasion. They are great names. My wife did rule out naming our kids these. Um, <laughs> So we've got a Hannah and a Joshua. I tried to say that Sinaranu Klein would be unique in preschool and kindergarten, but she didn't buy it. So at any rate, Sinaranu is the private merchant, and his grain, his beer, his olive oil to the palace he shall not deliver. His ship is exempt when it arrives from Crete. So we've got a guy importing stuff from Minoan Crete all the way to North Syria with grain and beer and olive oil, and he doesn't have to pay import tax. So I think this might be the first corporate tax exemption in history. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's possible. At any rate, this is what's happening very happily for a couple of centuries, from 17th century on down to 12th century BC, and in fact, a little bit earlier as well. They're happily doing diplomacy, reciprocity, trade, everything's ticking along, and then chaos. A little bit of chaos gets thrown in, and Bit by bit, or suddenly, everybody winks out except for the Egyptians. Everybody's gone. Just like the trailer, no more Minoans, no more Mycenaeans, no more Hittites, no more Canaanites, not like they used to be. Only the Egyptians survived, and even they were so weakened, it, they never were the same again. So it was a Pyrrhic victory, as you would say. So the big question, what caused this collapse? Just after 1200 BC. The magnitude was enormous. I would compare it to the Roman Empire, which is going to collapse 1500 years later. But the big question is, what caused it? And that's what I wanted to investigate. Now, the original hypothesis, what I was taught in college, what I was taught in graduate school, was very simply, it was the Sea Peoples. These were a group that the Egyptians recorded and that they came twice 1207 and 1177, though, you know, the Egyptologists keep changing their chronology. So a better way to say it is the fifth year of Merneptah and the eighth year of Ramses III. Uh, and in fact, when my book came out, you notice the title is taken from the second invasion, 1177 BC. When my book came out, um, I got a nice little email from a friend up in New York who said, nice book, title should have been 1186 BC. I wrote him back a two-word email. All I said was, it was. And in fact, the original contract for the book was 1186. But in the eight years that it took, or five years or so that it took to write, the Egyptologist changed the chronology on me. So at the last moment, I said, we got to change it, 1177. And actually, it might be a little bit snappier, I don't know. But in the meantime, they've been changing the chronology back again. So the next edition might have to be, or maybe 1186. <laughs> I don't know. At any rate, the inscription from 1177 is left to us on the wall at Mednit Habu, which is Ramses III's mortuary temple. And you can see it here. I know it's kind of hard to see, but we've got an inscription and we've got pictures. There was a land battle and a naval battle against this group of the Sea Peoples. And so already by the 1860s, a French Egyptologist named Gaston Maspero said that the Sea Peoples had been responsible for the collapse of the Late Bronze Age. Now, this was, this was a hypothesis. It basically got cemented into, into stone by about 1901. Um, but this was before most of the sites they were supposed to have been destroyed had actually been excavated. So thereafter, anybody, anytime anybody excavated a site that was destroyed, they said, ah, oh, the Sea Peoples did it. But that's kind of backwards, right? You want to excavate the sites first and then figure it out. 
But what Ramses told us, he told us uh, where they come from and who they were. The foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms from Hate. Now, we know where these places are. Hate of the Hittites, they're up in Turkey. Kode, that's where Turkey meets Syria. Carchemish, that's into Syria. Artsawa, that's the western coast of Turkey. Alashia, that is ancient Cyprus. That's where the copper's coming from. Um, being cut off at one time, a camp was set up and in one place in Amur. Amur, that's Amuru, that's the north coast of Syria. They desolated its people, its land was like that which has never come into being. They were coming forward toward Egypt while the flame was prepared before them. And then he tells us who they are. Their confederation was the Peleset, the Tajeku, the Shekelis, the Denyan, and the Weshes, lands united. Now, I'll venture a guess that most of the people in this world have never heard of these people. Um, but they do name them, and calling them the Sea Peoples, that's us. The Egyptians simply said some of them are from the sea, some are from the islands, but they basically gave us their actual names. Um, and then they named some others, the Shardana, the Weshes, the Tajeker, the Peleset, and they said they defeated them, which they did. 1207 and 1177, the Egyptians beat the Sea Peoples both times, mostly because I think they had time to prepare, whereas the other um, lands did not. And the Sea Peoples never came back again. That was it, it was just those two. Now, uh, if you want to see what they look like, Ramses III shows us. Here the pictures are. Um, and if you want to try and guess who they are, well, you have to play linguistic games, which may or may not work. So, Shardana, where in the Mediterranean or the Aegean is an area that looks like this? Like, take out the vowels, put it, leave in the consonants. Sardinia, yeah. Shekelesh. Maybe Sicily. The others, ah, I don't know. Tajeker could be the Troad or the Sickles. The Denyan could be Homer's Danaans, his Mycenaeans. The Weshes, not sure. Another name for Troy is Wilusa, maybe from there. It's really only the Plesset that we're pretty sure of, the Philistines. And already Jean-Francois Champollion, the guy that you know, deciphered hieroglyphics, he had already thought the Peleset were the Philistines. And in fact, the Philistines, the Bible says they come from Crete, so it might work out. So, but that's just the best guess. And even then, we've got a problem. Even if the Shardana and Sardinia are linked, is that where they came from? Or is that where they went to after they lost? Can't be sure. Ramses III does say he settled the Sea Peoples in Egypt and in the region of Canaan. So I actually, I do think that this is where they're coming from. I think they're going from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and indeed, if you excavate at places like Ashkelon and elsewhere, and you find Philistine material, it is what we would call degenerate Mycenaean. It looks like stuff from mainland Greece that the Mycenaeans made, but now they're making it with local clay from Cyprus and Rhodes and uh, Canaan, what is now Israel, Lebanon, Syria. So I do think that the Philistines, that part of the Sea Peoples, do have people from mainland Greece, namely Mycenaeans, in there. And this is a movement of peoples. It's not a Viking raid, these, these two things in 1207, 1177, because uh, Ramses shows us the pictures. The women are with them, the children are with them, the families, they're on ox carts with all of their belongings. Rather than Vikings, this is a migration. This is like the Dust Bowl in the 1930s with people moving from Oklahoma to Texas and California, started by famine or drought or what have you. So people have suggested that there's a nice linear uh, explanation that maybe there was a drought and then famine and then the sea people started moving and then they cut the trade routes and then that led to collapse. And that's well and good, but I think it's a little too simple. I think it's a little too simplistic. Nothing's, nothing's that easy. It's always much messier. And so while I do think that that's part of it, I think there's a lot more. So let me show you some of the other things that I think were going on there. Because if it's not the Sea Peoples, what could have caused it? Was it a drought? Was it famine? Was it invaders? Was it earthquakes? And to that I would answer, yes. I think it's all of the above. I think these are all what we call drivers or stressors, and I think they all impacted. 
Because I think you could survive a drought. You could survive famine. You could survive invaders and earthquakes. Not everybody would survive, but the civilization would. But what if more than one happened at once? What if two of them? What if instead of just a drought and famine, you also had earthquakes? And then you add in invaders? I think at that point you throw up your hands and go, all right, I give up. I think that's what we've got. I think it's a perfect storm. So let me show you what I mean. In terms of drought, this was already suggested back in the 1960s. Reese Carpenter, who taught at Bryn Mawr, he said that's why the Mycenaeans went down, because there was a drought. But it was just a hypothesis. He didn't actually have proof for it. The proof did not come along until about five years ago, when uh, Kaniuski, a French professor, went and did some coring. He did some core samples in Syria, where they went into the dried up lakes and lagoons, took a core, then looked at the pollen that was in there. And the pollen is from plants that are suddenly now in an arid environment. So he said, there is evidence that in the late 13th, early 12th century, so around 1200 BC, and going for about 300 years down to the 9th century, that there is what he called euphemistically a dry event. I think this is what we would call a drought. So this is the scientific evidence that Reese Carpenter was lacking. We now have it. Yes, there was a drought. So Kaniuski then went to Cyprus, did the same thing at a site called Hala Sultanteki, which has a dried up lagoon. And sure enough, from about 1200 to 850 BC, there is an environmental change and the plants show that there is an arid environment. Then we've got uh, a friend of mine, Lee Drake, who pulled in some other stuff, including changes in the temperature of the surface of the sea, which means less rainfall on the mainland of Greece. Uh, evidence from caves in Israel and elsewhere. And these also showed that there is a drought from, eh, that started. He didn't say when it ended, but it started sometime before 1200 BC. And then most recently, Donna Langut, who you see in the lower right hand, uh, and my colleague Israel Finkelstein and Thomas Litt from Germany, they did the same thing at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and the western shore of the, De of the Dead Sea. And they also came up for evidence for a drought from about 1250 BC on, but it's shorter here. It only goes to about 1100 BC. So drought in Syria, Israel, Cyprus, Greece at this time, I think we've got evidence for a drought and that's what we were lacking before. So of course, every time they published this, the, uh, the newspapers got hold of it. New York Times, right, the LA Times, and they started calling it climate change, which it, it definitely was, but it's mother nature, not, not humans. Uh, as far as I can tell, the Hittites were not driving SUVs at the time. Uh, I think they had chariots, but still it's mother nature, climate change. Um, National Geographic got into it, Archaeology Magazine, Drought May of Doom, Bronze Age Civilizations, New York Post got into it, they added globalization in just for good measure, right? And then um, the NASA funded study that said, except it wasn't NASA, said that we were going to go down in a couple of decades, at which point I weighed in on the Huffington Post, uh, the collapse of civilizations. It's complicated, uh, which, which it is. So. Uh, if you've got drought, you should probably also have famine, right? But this is a little bit harder to find unless you've got like mass graves or something like that. Here we would want written evidence and then, then we'd be good. And indeed, we have it. So I take you back to Ugarit on the coast of Syria again. And here in the archives, we have a letter from a merchant named Orte Ortenu and he is talking about famine in the city of Imar in inland Syria in about 1185. And he says, there's famine in our house. We'll all die of hunger if you don't quickly arrive here. We ourselves will die of hunger. Sorry, that's my alarm. I know I'm running short on time. You don't all have Indiana Jones as your alarm? Maybe it's just me. All right, so where was it? If you don't quickly arrive here, we will die of hunger. You will not see a living soul from your land. So he actually says there's famine. I'm gonna take him at his word because uh, a letter from the king of Ugarit says the same thing. Here with me, plenty has become famine. Hittite king up in Turkey. Do you not know there was a famine in the midst of my lands? It's a matter of life and death. 
So I think we've got famine, right? Would you agree? Yeah? Okay. Invaders, though. This can be a little bit more difficult. Invaders versus internal rebellion. We do have a letter, again from Ugarit, that is talking about enemy ships that have been sighted. He says, they've come, they've been setting fire to my cities and have done harm to the land. And he basically asked the king of Cyprus, um, if other ships are coming, please let me know. So invaders, yes. Are they sea peoples? We don't know for sure, but definitely somebody is invading. Uh, another letter from Ugarit. When your messenger arrived, the army was already humiliated and the city was sacked. Our food was burnt, the vineyards were destroyed, our city is sacked. May you know it, may you know it. So definitely invaders. Uh, and indeed, Kaniuski, when he took the pollen cores up in North Syria, they also found destruction levels and asked if it was sea peoples. The problem is, whoever it was didn't leave a calling card. So we're not sure. And I give you Canaanite Hatsor as one example of the problems involved. We know this city is destroyed somewhere around 1250 to 1200 BC. We can see it. The late Bronze Age palace is burnt to a crisp. All these mud bricks are burnt cherry red and all of that. But the two co-directors uh, co were unable to decide who destroyed it. Amnon ben Tor said um, it's probably not Egyptians or Canaanites because there are statues in the destruction that are defaced. And he said no Egyptians would have defaced Egyptian statues and no Canaanites would have defaced Canaanite statues. So it has to be somebody else. He says Hatsor is too far inland. It can't be the Sea Peoples, which I would disagree with. The Sea Peoples get very far inland. So he said it's got to be Joshua and the biblical account has to be correct. His co-director, Sharon Zuckerman, who unfortunately just uh, passed away recently, said, I'm not, that we have a problem. If you look at the destruction, it's actually just the palace and the temples that are burnt. The actual houses of the people and their shops and all that are not touched. And she says, that's what happens when you have an internal rebellion, when the lower classes rise up and overthrow the elite because they're hungry or they're not getting paid. And so she said, I think it's an internal rebellion. So my point here is if the two co-directors of Hatsor can't decide if invaders or locals destroyed their site, it's kind of hard for us. All we can do is say it was destroyed. And indeed, earthquakes could have done it as well. And I'll just show you very quickly that there are earthquakes at almost every place that's destroyed. This is a map of the sites that are destroyed, about 1,200. And if you overlay it on a map of earthquakes that have happened just since 1900, you can see that most of the destroyed sites are in active seismic areas, all right? So we've got fault lines going all over this place. Uh, and indeed, fault lines usually unzip. If a major earthquake hits and it doesn't release all the pressure, you'll get another earthquake nearby very soon after, days, weeks, a decade, and the fault will unzip. It's called an earthquake sequence over a period of about 50 years. And then the pressure builds up again for 400 years. So modern earthquakes are called sequences. Modern, uh, ancient ones that do this are called earthquake storms. And I think an earthquake storm hit the Mediterranean between about 1225 and 1175. And so Amos Knorr at Stanford and I looked at this and we found all kinds of examples. I won't go into much detail except to say that here at Mycenae, that um, slope underneath the built wall, that's one half of an earthquake fault zone. And so somebody looked at this and went, wait, the Mycenaeans built one of their major cities on top of an active earthquake zone? Who would do that? And Amos Knorr said, well, I live in San Francisco. Uh, we've kind of done the same thing. So, so at Mycenae, they, we have victims from earthquakes. Uh, this is the same skeleton in both pictures. On the right, though, you can see that stone that's near the head. That was actually found embedded in the skull. She had sheltered in a doorway, which is usually the best place. In this case, no, the doorway collapsed and killed her. Same thing at nearby Tiryns in Greece, uh, a mother and child buried by a fallen wall. Over at Troy, Troy 6, destroyed by an earthquake, that tilted wall, here it is, I took this last August or so, that wall's not supposed to tilt like that. That's what happens in an earthquake. And even at Ugarit, trust me, 
that wall did not look like that originally. That's what happens after you get an earthquake. So I would suggest that earthquakes happened, and then because of all this, I think we get a migration and a cutting of the trade routes. So all that copper and tin, as I mentioned at the beginning, if that trade route is cut at any point, you're gonna be in trouble. And I think that's one of the things that happens. So let me sum up by giving you three points that I think I'm pretty confident we can all agree on. First of all, would you agree? We've got a number of separate civilizations back then, and we've looked at a few of them. They uh, were flourishing. They were independent, but interacted with each other, right? I've given you some examples. Would I uh, uh, be confident that you agree with that? Yeah, separate, but interacting. Uh, would you agree that many cities are destroyed and come to an end? Well, you might have to take my word for it or read the book, but uh, I think Yes, many cities were destroyed. I, hopefully you will agree. And third, that there's no proof as to who or what caused this. In short, there's no answer, right? Would you agree with that? Hopefully, those who have read the book are nodding. So, okay. Um, some people still, in fact, I heard it at our annual meetings last year, they still want a linear progression. I still say that is um, too simple and it was much messier. So again, if you ask me, drought? Famine, earthquake, invaders, rebellions? I'd say yes, all of the above. And I think what we've got is a domino effect, that these guys were interacting so much and they were dependent on each other for raw materials like gold, silver, tin, copper, that when one of them got hit, they would have all been impacted. I think that was what we've got here. And indeed, I would give it a name. I would say it's what we call a systems collapse. The whole system collapsed. Colin Renfrew already talked about this back in 1979. And he says um, the central administration collapses, traditional elite goes away, centralized economy goes, your population shifts. And it doesn't just take place in one year, it can take up to a century. And so I actually told um, Rob Tempio, my editor, that calling my book 1177 was not right. That it didn't happen in that one year, it took a century. Uh, and he said, well, what do you want to call it? And I said, well, things in 1200 were different from 1100 and very different from 1000. He said, that won't fit on the book cover, which is true. So basically for me, 1177 is like 476 is for the fall of the Roman Empire. We know Rome didn't fall. We know it took most of the fifth century to do. And we know that the Eastern Roman Empire kept going, and yet we are taught as shorthand that 476 is the collapse of the Roman Empire. For me, that's what 1177 is, that it is shorthand for an event that might have taken as much as 100 years. So I don't want to leave you without takeaway lessons. What can we learn from this? Well, um, are we facing a similar situation today that they were facing back then? Climate change, anybody? We can debate about that all afternoon, but I think many would say yes. Famines and droughts anywhere in the world? Yeah. Earthquakes? Yeah. Rebellions? Yeah. I think the only thing we're missing are the sea peoples. <laughs> and in fact, I think we've got those too. And I think we actually have a choice. I think our sea peoples are either ISIS, which is busy destroying the Middle East, or the refugees that have been fleeing from the Syrian civil war. I think they both qualify. It depends if you want to see the sea peoples as victims or as oppressors. And I think in antiquity they were both. And so I think we've actually got these as well. But let me put it another way. In the last couple of years, ripped from the headlines in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, Greece's economy is tanked, right? Internal rebellions in Libya, Egypt, and Syria with outsiders and foreign warriors have been fanning the flames, right? We've all been watching this. Turkey's afraid it's gonna be involved. Israel is also afraid. Jordan's crowded with refugees, right? This is all last, what, five, 10 years at the most. Iran is always still bellicose and threatening. Iraq is, again, in turmoil. So what would we have had if we could read newspapers from 1200 BC? Pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so my job as an ancient historian is to look back. But you know, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. So I actually think that looking at what happened to civilizations more than 3,200 years ago is a little more than an exercise in ancient history. I think it might actually have some 
uh, relevance to today. So those of you that are going to go on and make our future, remember what happened to them. And every civilization so far in the history of the world has collapsed. Are we immune? We'll see if we are. Thank you. So I know many of you will have to run to your next class, and so we'll excuse you, but we do have 10 minutes for questions. So for those who would like to stay for a few minutes, uh, what we'll do is we'll ask you to come down to the microphone, make this scary long walk, tell us what you're studying or uh, what you teach. And uh, again, we just have a few minutes for questions. If there are, maybe I persuaded everybody. <laughs> I have a question for you. What one thing did you think would be here that I left out, that I did not talk about, that you think should have been a stressor or anything like that? What did I leave out? Anybody? Because there was something major that I was totally expecting that I have not found evidence for. Disease? Anybody? Disease? Where's the disease? Where's the cholera, the typhoid, the this, the that, the other? We don't have that. Not yet. I, and I'm surprised by it. Now, it would be, I think, hard to find it, just like hard for famine, but we don't even have textual records of it. So if somebody says that we will have it, I won't be at all surprised, but so far, not so much yet. Just out of curiosity for the, oh, okay. My name is Benjamin Lottie. I'm an international relations major here. Um, my, my question is, what ex so you said that it's very much like today, and I can see the parallels, but would you say as, as a result of like, for example, these invaders and, uh, and perhaps these refugees at the same time, do you think uh, the collapse, well, the collapse was led to as a result of these, state, these foreign states either not doing anything or, or just acting in their own self-interest, or, or would you, or, or have you found evidence to suggest they actually work together to try to combat this? Good question. So back then, were they working together or separately? Excellent question. Uh, the short answer is there's no evidence that they were working together. Now, they do have things like mutual defense treaties at that time, but we don't have anything where somebody says, help, help, I'm being attacked. Um, come to my rescue. The closest we've got is that letter from the king of Ugarit to the king of Cyprus talking about the enemy ships. That would be the closest. But he, even he doesn't ask for help. So I don't think that they came to each other's rescue. I think that they went down one by one, uh, in part maybe because they didn't rally around. Now, the Egyptians do survive. I think they had um, at least five years warning to get ready, but uh, the others that may have come upon them suddenly because they didn't have tweeting and text and email back then. So it may be that the invaders got there uh, before the news did. Thank you. We had a little lighting collapse there. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, well join me in thanking Professor Klein.